shall i start good afternoon dear students first of all i would like to invite you all for this session of edusat program on basics of electrical and electronics engineer dear students i hope you have understood the concepts which have been explained in the last class my teammate has explained many of the important concepts of electrical engineering in the last class so let us try to recall those concepts which have been explained in the last class so let us try to recollect all those concepts which have been explained in the last class first one is the importance of electrical energy okay so what is electrical energy it is an invisible energy which constitutes electrical current the flow of electric current in the circuit so electrical energy always constitutes the flow of electron to do some work in the electrical circuit okay so in normal usage the electrical energy is also known as electricity okay even though it is invisible energy we can feel the presence of this electricity in various forms and we use this electrical energy to do our daily activities in many forms we use electrical energy to do for lighting for uh, heating for communication and for transportation for entertainment for calculation etc etc we use there are so many applications of electrical energy and also this energy can be converted into other forms of energy and at the same time other forms of energy can also be converted into electrical energy that is the importance of electrical energy okay also in the last class my teammate has explained you about electric current and potential as well as potential difference okay in this class let us try to know some of the other concepts of electrical engineering and these are the contents of today's session in this session i am going to explain you about some of the important concepts like concept of resistance instruments used to measure resistance ohms law applications and limitations of ohms law resistance law of resistance resistivity series and parallel connection of resistances effective resistance in series and parallel circuit numerical examples will also be dealt in this class okay first let us see what is electric current electric current is nothing but the flow of electrons around a circuit in this slide you can see the diagram there is an electric circuit which consists of the source of electrical energy and the current is flowing through the circuit and the flow of electrons have been represented and as soon as there is flow of current in the circuit the lamp glows okay this flow of electrons in the circuit is known as electric current and the circuit which carries the current is known as electric circuit and the unit of current is ampere and it is abbreviated as amps so let us look into other slide that is the voltage or the potential difference what do you mean by voltage voltage it is the measure of electrical pressure between two points of an electric circuit okay so if there are two charged bodies 
and if there is difference of potential between those two charged bodies then that a difference of electric potential is known as potential difference. Now, you can look in the slide that is there are two potential one is the high potential and another one is the low potential this one is the high potential charged body and this one is the charged body at low potential. The difference of potential between these two charged bodies it is known as potential difference and also the potential difference is expressed in volts and that is the unit of potential difference. And the meters which are used for the measurement of voltage and current the different instruments which are used to measure the potential difference are voltmeters, millivolt meters, multimeters. These are the different meters which are used for the measurement of voltage and the instruments which are used for the measurement of current are ammeters, milliammeters, multimeters, meters and galvanometers. This galvanometer is used usually to detect the presence of current in the circuit. So, this slide shows an electric circuit. So, what is an electric circuit? Circuit is nothing but a closed conducting path through which the electric current flows or is intended to flow. Okay. So, the arrow shows the flow of electric current in the circuit. Okay. This circuit consists of two types of elements one is called the active element and another one is called the passive element. This is the active element which is nothing but the source of electrical energy and the passive element which consumes electrical energy and these two elements are connected by means of the conducting material and the electron starts, starts flowing from this active element to the passive element which constitutes electric current and this closed path which carries electrons it is known as the electric circuit. Okay. With this background let us start today's session that is let us try to know in this session about the importance of resistance. Okay. Then what is resistance? Resistance is the property of a substance due to which it opposes the flow of electrons through it is called resistance. That means, it is the inherent property of the substance. Okay. Because of that property, the substance is going to oppose the flow of electrons in the material. Okay. The practical unit of resistance is ohms. Why it is called as ohms? It is named in the honor of the great physicist George Simon Ohm. Okay. Then why does this opposition is offered by the material? It is because of the atomic structure of the material. Dear students, all of you are well familiar with the atomic structure of the material. So, let us have a look at the atomic structure of the material. So, this is the atomic structure of any material or the matter. You know that the matter consists of minute particles called atoms and each atom constitutes three fundamental particles protons, neutrons as well as electrons. And the two fundamental particles that is protons as well as the neutrons they are they reside inside the nucleus whereas, the electrons they rotate in the different orbits around this nucleus and you can observe the electrons which are rotating around the nucleus in the different orbits. Okay. So, in this case these electrons while revolving around the nucleus in the different orbits they are strongly attached with the nucleus, but this binding force goes on decreasing as the distance between the orbit and the nucleus increases. That is further the orbit lesser will be the binding force between the nucleus and the electrons. So, if the electron is revolving in the outermost orbit then definitely it is loosely bound with the nucleus than the electron which is there in the inner orbit. Therefore, whatever electrons which are there in the outermost orbit can be easily detached from the nucleus. You look at this picture. In this picture also there are three different orbits. The electrons which are there in the inner orbit they are strongly bound with the nucleus whereas, the electrons which are there in the outermost orbit they can be easily detached. Okay. In this diagram an electron has been shown whereas, this electron has been detached from the orbit and it is, it is leaving behind a hole in the orbit. Therefore, this electron is known as a free electron. This free electron can 
move from one atom to another atom. So, the electron which has been moved out of its orbit of its atom, it is known as free electron. Like this, since the matter consists of numerous uh, elect, uh, numerous number of uh, free electrons, these free electrons start moving from one atom to another atom. So, this slide shows number of free electrons. These free electrons, they start moving from one atom to another atom. While moving, so what happens? Their movement, that is the movement of the free electrons has been restricted by the other atoms and molecules of the matter. You can observe number of atoms and at the same time you can observe these free electrons also. These are the free electrons whereas, these are the other atoms of the matter. When the electrons are moving, what happens? these electrons are moving from this atom to this atom while moving. So, this movement has been restricted or opposed by the other electrons. This opposition offered to the movement of free electrons by other mole molecules and atoms of the matter, this is called resistance. Due to this agitation, heat is generated in this process and this opposition offered by the atoms and the molecules for the movement of electrons, this is known as resistance of the material. So, resistance is the inherent property of the material and it is because due to the atomic structure of the material. Okay. So, you look at this slide. This is the person, he is a great physician, German physicist. He is the person who gave one of the important law of electricity and that law is known as Ohm's law. He did lot of experiments on voltage, current, electrical energy as well as resistance and in 1827 he published a paper and the name of that paper is Galvanic Circuit Investigated Mathematically. At the initial stage, his work was criticized, but later it was renowned and he was considered as one of the great physicists, German physicist, and he became the professor of Munich University also. And this fellow, that is George Simon Ohm, a German physicist, he gave his um, experimental results in the form of a law that is called Ohm's law. What is the importance of Ohm's law? So far, I have explained about some of the concepts. Those concepts are electrical resistance, electric current and electrical potential as well as the potential difference. Is there any relationship between these fundamental concepts? Yes, there exists a definite relationship between these concepts. Okay. And this fellow, he gave uh, the relationship between these fundamental concepts and this relationship is framed in the form of a law called Ohm's law. So, what does this Ohm's law says? Let us see. Okay. Ohm's law states that the current flowing through a conductor is directly proportional to the voltage V applied between the ends of the conductor and inversely proportional to the resistance R of the conductor provided the temperature of the conductor is maintained constant. You just look into this circuit. Okay. This circuit consists of, consists of a um, conductor and the resistance of the conductor is R and the current flowing in the circuit is I whereas the voltage applied between the ends of the conductor is V. This is the voltage and the ammeter has been connected in the circuit and this ammeter is just to detect the flow of current and to measure the magnitude of the current which is flowing in the circuit. Okay. Well, so, what does this Ohm's law states that? That is the current I which is flowing in the circuit, the current I, I is the magnitude of the current and the current I which is flowing in the circuit that is through the conductor, this is the conductor and this is the resistance of the conductor. This current is directly proportional to the voltage applied between ends of the conductor. What is the voltage applied? The voltage applied between the ends of the conductor is V and the current is directly proportional to V. Current is represented by I and voltage is represented by V and I is proportional to V. And at the same time, the current flowing through the conductor is inversely proportional to resistance of the conductor. Resistance is R, 
the resistance of the conductor is R and the current which is flowing in the circuit is inversely proportional to R. By combining these two equations, it becomes I is proportional to V by R. By removing the proportionality mark, then the equation becomes I is equal to V divided by R. This is the relationship between current, voltage as well as the resistance in the circuit. Okay. So, this expression is nothing but Ohm's law. Okay. So, this uh, circuit shows the Ohm's law in the mathematical, in the form of mathematical expression. This is the circuit, this is the voltage applied between the two, point, two points of the resistor or the conducting material, whereas where R is the resistance between the two points of the inductor and I is the current which is flowing in the circuit. So, the equation which gives the relationship between the three parameters is V the voltage applied it is equal to the product of current I which is flowing in the circuit and the resistance of the conductor. This is another form of Ohm's law V is equal to I into R by this equation it is possible to derive the equation for the electrical power also later it will be discussed. So, P is equal to I into V or in terms of only current it is the square of current and resistance. This is once again another mathematical expression by which the Ohm's law can be expressed. So, this triangle is known as magic triangle for Ohm's law. So, you just look into this triangle, it shows the three parameters which are linked by Ohm's law. The three parameters are the voltage, current as well as the resistance. You just look into this circle, this circle uses E instead of V. In this con context E and V are the same meaning that is the electromotive force or the voltage applied between the ends of the conductor. So, Ohm's law can be expressed in three different forms. The three different mathematical expressions are E or V it is equal to I into R that is the product of current and the resistance and the uh, current in the circuit I is equal to E divided by V that is R V divided by R and the resistance in the circuit is given by R is equal to E divided by I that is it is the ratio of voltage to current in the circuit. Why this letter E has been easy used? It is just to it is just to memorize the equation easily because the alphabets are in the uh, alphabetical order, the letters are there in the alphabetical order. So, instead of V, E has been used. Either you can use E or V, both are one and the same in this context. Therefore, this is the magical triangle which shows the relationship between three important concepts. So, now let us look into the applications of the Ohm's law. So, what I told Ohm's law is used in order to give or in order to find any one parameter if other two parameters are known. That means, if the current is known in the circuit, then automatically if uh, voltage is known in the circuit, then by knowing these two parameters, it is possible to calculate the third parameter. But for what kind of circuits or under what circumstances we can apply this law? That is the application of the Ohm's law. Let us see now, what are the applications of Ohm's law? Ohm's law is applicable for both DC and AC circuits. So, whatever might be the type of the circuit. In electrical circuits, there are two types. One is AC circuit and another one is DC circuit. What is AC circuit? The circuit wherein alternating current flows, it is known as AC circuit. The circuit wherein direct current flows, it is called direct circuit. So, irrespective of the type of the circuit, the Ohm's law is applicable for both DC and AC circuit, both direct current circuits as well as AC circuits uh, that is alternating current circuits. So, the other application is if the circuit is simple, Ohm's law cannot be applied to complicated circuit, it can be applied only to simple circuit. This is another application of the Ohm's law that is it can be applied to simple circuits only. And Ohm's law is applicable only to, I, oh, it can be applied either to whole circuit or part of the circuit. Suppose the circuit consists of number of branches, two or three branches, either it can be applied to the entire circuit or it can be applied to the single branch also. So, it is applicable either to whole circuit or 
part of the circuit. So, these are the applications of the Ohm's law. So, in what kind of circuit we can apply Ohm's law? Ohm's law is applied to both AC and DC circuit. It is applied only for simple circuits. It can be applied for the entire circuit or part of circuit. Then, the limitations of Ohm's law, where else we cannot apply the Ohm's law, that is called the limitations of Ohm's law. Ohm's law is not applicable under all circumstances. It is applicable only for the cases which has been shown in the last slide. So, let us see now what are the limitations of the Ohm's law. Ohm's law holds good only at constant temperature. This is one of the foremost important condition which has to be applied before applying Ohm's law. You just look into the statement of the Ohm's law. Statement of the Ohm's law states that at constant temperature. So, Ohm's law holds good only at constant temperature. If the temperature is varied, we cannot apply this law. Therefore, Ohm's law is applicable only at constant temperature. If there is any variation in the temperature in the circuit, temperature of the conductor, then Ohm's law is not at all applicable. Therefore, temperature plays an important role in the application of the Ohm's law. Why does temperature plays an important role? Because temperature has different effects on different type of materials. In electrical engineering, the materials are classified into three types as conductors, insulators as well as semiconductors. So, the temperature has different effects on different type of materials. In case of conductors, as the temperature increases, the resistance of those materials also increases. So, if there is any variation in the temperature, automatically it is reflected by the variation in the resistance. Whereas, in case of semiconductors, as the temperature increases, then what happens? The resistance of those semiconductor material decreases. So, with the decrease in uh, the, with the increase in the temperature, the semiconductor behaves as a conductor. Once again, the temperature has a different effect on semiconductors. Whereas, in case of electrolytes as well as the insulator, in some cases the temperature with the variation in the temperature, the resistance remains constant. In certain cases, the resistance increases in certain type of insulators and electrolytes, the resistance decreases. So, temperature is going to vary the resistance value. Since the temperature has a different uh, impacts on the value of the resistance, this law can be uh, applied only under constant temperature. So, this is the foremost important point which has to be kept in mind. Where, where we can apply this Ohm's law? Ohm's law can be applied only when there is no variation in the temperature. If there is any variation in the temperature of the circuit or the conductor, then Ohm's law cannot, uh, cannot be applied. And Ohm's law is not applicable, it cannot be applied to electrolytes. Just now I told that in case of insulators and electrolytes also, there is variation in the value of resistance with the variation in the temperature. You know that the Ohm's law is not applicable to circuits where temperature is changing. Once again, since in case of electrolytes also, with the variation in the temperature, there is variation in the resistance. Therefore, Ohm's law cannot be applied to these circuits also, that is for electrolytes. Next, it cannot be applied to semiconductors. That is, I told that the semiconductors are the materials in which as the temperature increases, the resistance goes on decreasing. Once again, there is variation in the resistance. Therefore, this is another limitation of the Ohm's law. That is, it cannot be applied to semiconductors. Another important limitation of Ohm's law is it cannot be applied to vacuum tubes and discharge lamps. In this case also, temperature plays an important role since with the variation in the temperature, there is the circuit the circuit of vacuum tubes and discharge lamps is associated with a lot of variations in the temperature. Wherever there is variation in the temperature, Ohm's law is not at all applicable. Therefore, in case of vacuum tubes as well as the discharge lamps also, Ohm's law cannot be applied. This is another limitation. So, the last one is it cannot be applied to complicated circuits having more number of branches and EMF sources. That is, if the circuit is more complicated, which is consisting of number of EMF sources, more than one EMF source or which is having number of branches. In that case also, Ohm's law is not applicable. So, these are the limitations of the Ohm's law. What are the limitations? It holds good only at constant temperature. It cannot be applied to electrolytes. 
it cannot be applied to semiconductors, it cannot be applied to vacuum tubes and discharge lamps and it cannot be applied to complicated circuits having more number of branches and EMF sources. So, even though it is an important law which gives the relationship between voltage, current and resistance, there are certain limitations for the application of this law. Now, once again let us have a um, discussion about the resistance. Okay. At the beginning itself I told that it is the property of a substance due to which it opposes the flow of electrons through it. Okay. Why, does this, uh, why does this opposition offers? I have already explained to you it is because of the opposition offered by the atoms and molecules within the material for the movement of the free electrons. And what is the unit of the resistance? The unit of resistance is ohms in the honor of the great physicist George Simon Ohm of Germany. Okay. So, how to define one ohm of resistance? It is the unit of resistance, ohms is the unit of resistance. So, how to define one ohm of resistance? A conductor is said to have one ohm of resistance if it permits one ampere of current to flow through it when one volt is applied across its terminals. That is resistance is nothing but the ratio of voltage to current R is equal to V by I. When the voltage applied across the terminals is equal to 1 volt and if it causes current of 1 ampere to flow between the ends of the conductor then the resistance of that material will be called as 1 ohm. Okay. It is represented by R, 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 either capital R or small r, these are the symbols which are used. Okay. These are the different types of resistors which are used in the practical circuit. This, this picture shows various types of resistors. And the symbol of resistor, how to represent the resistor in a circuit? The resistance has been represented by the symbol shown in the circuit. This is the symbol of the resistance and this picture shows the practical resistors. Okay. Just have a look at this picture. So, color bands, in, color bands are shown on the body of the resistor. What is the importance of these color bands? Since the magnitude of, magnitude of the resistance has not been given with the resistance, in order to know the magnitude of the resistance, different color bands are printed over the body of the resistance. These color bands, they are going to, going to represent the magnitude of the resistance. That is the importance of different color bands which are there on the body of the resistor. These are the actual resistors which are used to impose resistance in the electrical circuit and this is the symbol of resistance. And let us look into the multiples and sub multiples of ohms. What do you mean by multiples and sub multiples of ohms? Okay. Just now I told that ohms is the unit which is used to measure the resistance in the circuit. Sometimes this ohm may be a bigger unit or smaller unit. Suppose if you take the insulation resistance of a cable or insulation resistance of a machine, in that case ex uh, resistance of the cable is usually expressed in mega ohms. Therefore, ohm will be a smaller unit and in certain cases it will be a bigger unit. So, in order to give the suitable values or in order to express the magnitude of resistance in suitable values, the multiples and sub multiples of the resistance are shown. These are the multiples mega and kilo, they are the multiples of ohms whereas, centi, milli as well as micro, they are considered as the sub multiples of resistance. So, mega and kilo, they are the bigger units of resistance. What is 1 mega ohm? 1 mega ohm is equal to 1 million ohms and it is represented, the abbreviation used for, used to represent 1 million ohm is M capital M, so capital letter mega ohms and 1 mega ohm is equal to 10 to the power of 6 ohms, that is 1 million ohms, it is a bigger unit of ohms. And another multiple of ohms is kilo, what do you mean by 1 kilo ohm? 1 kilo ohm is equal to 1000 ohms and 1 kilo ohm is equal to 10 to the power of 3 ohms. These are the two multiples of ohms. And third one is the centi ohms, it is a sub multiple of ohm. 1 centi ohms is nothing but 1 hundredth of the ohm and it is represented, the abbreviation used to represent 1 centi ohm is C ohms and 1 centi ohm is equal to 10 to the power of minus 2 or 1 divided by 100. 
Next one is milliohms. One milliohm is one thousand ohm, and it is represented. The abbreviation used is milliohm, small m, milliohms, and one milliohm is equal to ten to the power of minus three ohms, or one divided by thousand ohms. This is the smaller unit as sub multiples of ohm. Next one is microohms. Microohm is one millionth of one ohm, and the abbreviation used is this one microohms, and it is. Equal to 10 to the power of minus 6 ohms. So these are the multiples and sub multiples of ohms which are used to represent the magnitude of resistance for either higher resistance or lower resistance. Then this is law of resistance, which is going to indicate on the physical parameters on which the resistance of the material depends. Now let us look into this. These physical parameters on which the resistance of the material depends. Okay, and these are combined in the form of a law, and that is called laws of resistance. So, what does this law of resistance says? Let us see now. Okay, the resistance R depends on the following factors. What are the factors on which the resistance depends? Let us see one by one. First of all, the first factor on which the resistance depends is it varies directly with the length L of the conductor. Okay, so physical parameter on which the resistance depends is length of the conductor. How it varies directly with the length of the Conductor. That means, as the length of the conductor increases, then automatically the resistance also increases. That is called direct proportionality relationship. So it varies directly with the length of the conductor. Next one is it varies inversely as the cross sectional area A of the conductor. That is, as the cross sectional area A of the conductor is increased, then automatically the resistance decreases. As the cross sectional area increases. The resistance decreases. That is, it varies inversely as the cross-sectional area A of the conductor. The third factor is it depends on the nature of the material. It depends on the nature of the material means whether the material is in the solid form, liquid form, or gaseous form. These are the nature of the materials. So resistance also depends on the nature of the material. Another important factor on which the resistance is, you know, the importance of the temperature. This is the fourth factor. That is the resistance of the conductor. It depends on the temperature of the conductor. Okay, as the temperature varies, then resistance also varies. All these factors have been summarized in the form of the mathematical expressions. So, by combining all these factors, we can write it as, or we can say, it is R is directly proportional to L and inversely proportional to A. That is, R is proportional to L divided by A, or R is equal to rho. Rho into L divided by A, or rho is equal to R into A by L, where rho is called the specific resistance or resistivity of the material, and it is measured in ohm meters. Just look into this slide. This shows the conductor with resistance R. And this is the flow of current which is in the material, and this is the length of the conductor. It has been represented by letter L. The resistance is represented by letter R, and A shows the cross-sectional area of the conductor. The by law of resistance, the resistivity of the material rho is given by the expression rho is equal to R into A divided by L. This is the law of resistivity. Then, well, this is another important concept. Just now, I told the importance of temperature and the resistance. I told that the temperature variation has different effects on different type of materials in conductors. Let me repeat it once again. In conductors, as the temperature varies, the resistance of the material goes on decreasing. In case of insulators, sometimes there may not be any variation in the resistance with the variation in the temperature. Whereas in case of semiconductors, as the temperature increases, the resistance Resistance of the material decreases. Okay, now let us take the case of the conductors. What I told in case of conductors, as the temperature is increased, the resistance is also increasing. But as the temperature is decreased, then the resistance also decreases. Then what is this superconductor? 
in a superconductor as the resistance drops abruptly to zero then when the material is cooled below its critical temperature. That means as the temperature is decreased the resistance also goes on decreasing, but if the temperature reaches a temperature called critical temperature when it reaches a value called critical temperature then the resistance of that conductor becomes zero. At this point what happens? This material becomes a superconductor that means there will not be any resistance. Okay. Keep this point in mind students, whatever might be the uh, resistivity less, uh, less resistivity material, no material on the earth has got zero resistance at present at the normal temperature. How good conductor it may be, all conductors possess certain amount of resistance, it is the inherent property of the substance. If it is possible to obtain zero resistance material at normal temperature, then that would be a superconductor. What is the importance of superconductor? The superconductor is one which has got zero resistance. So, an electric current flowing through a superconducting wire can persist indefinitely with no power source. So, the power source is essential only to start the flow of current. Once the current starts flowing, then there will not be any usage of the power source. So, but for the time being there are no such superconductors at the normal temperature, but inventions are still going on. Okay. So, that is the importance of a superconductor. So, what is a superconductor? A superconductor is one which has no resistance or zero resistance. Now, let us look into the instruments which are used to measure the resistance. What are the instruments which are used to measure resistance? There are so many different types of or varieties of instruments which are used to measure this parameter. One of the important type of instrument is Meggers. Meggers are used to measure the insulation resistance of an equipment or machinery. The in this case usually Meggers are used to measure high value of resistance. Therefore, the resistance is measured in mega ohms. Therefore, wherever there is high resistance in the circuit usually in case of the insulation measurement of the insulation resistance of the equipment or cable or machinery makers are used in the circuit. So, they measure the resistance in mega ohms. This is one of the important instrument used to measure this parameter. Another important instrument which is used to measure resistance is ohm meter. Ohm meter is used to measure the resistance of a coil in ohms. Multimeters are other instruments which are also used to measure the resistance of the circuit. But what is the importance of the multimeter? Multimeter is also known as a v o meter. Why it is called so? Because multimeter it is not a single instrument instead it is the combination of different type of meters that it is a combination of a meter volt meter as well as um, ohm meter. A meter is used to measure current in the circuit whereas, volt meter is used to measure voltage in the circuit and ohm meter is used to measure resistance in the circuit. So, it is a combination of three different meters. So, it is called as multimeter. So, it is also known as A V ohm meter that is a combination of a meter A stands for a meter, V stands for volt meter and O stands for ohm meter. So, it is one such important instrument which could be used to measure three different parameters that is used to measure the voltage, current as well as the resistance. So, these are the different instruments which are used to measure resistance that is megas, ohmmeters as well as the multimeters are the different instruments which are used to measure the resistance in the circuit. We can have a look at the pictures of the ohmmeter, megas as well as the multimeter. This picture shows the picture of the ohmmeter. So, these are digital ohm meters, these are megas used to measure high value of resistance that is insulation resistance. These are the different type of multimeters, this one shows the digital multimeter that is in the magnitude will be given in the form of the digits and this one is the analog multimeter where in the pointer is going to indicate the value of the resistance. So, there are two types of multimeters one is digital multimeter and another one is the analog multimeter. These are the two different type of multimeters which are available in the market. 
Now let us look into the way in which the resistances can be connected in the circuit. So, resistance is used to limit the current in the circuit. So, in order to limit the current resistance will be connected in various methods or in various patterns. So, what are the patterns in which the resistances can be connected? Let us look into that aspect now. So, the resistances can be connected in different formats known as series connection, series connection, parallel connection and series parallel connection of resistances. And this circuit shows the series connection of resistances. What do you mean by series connection? Just look into the picture, how they are connected. So, the each resistance has got two ends, this is the starting end and this one is the finishing end. This is the starting end of B and this is the finishing end of B resistance and this is the starting end of C and this is the finishing end of R3 resistance. So, this circuit shows three different resistances which are connected in the series. So, what do you mean by series connection? If the finishing end of one resistance is connected with the starting end of next one. Similarly, the finishing end of of that resistance is connected with the starting end of next resistance. This configuration is known as series connection of resistances. That means they are connected so as to form a chain, chain in the circuit. So, this type of pattern is known as series connection of resistances. Now, let us see what will be the total resistance, what will be the total current and the voltage applied in the circuit. Okay. So, how many resistances are there? There are three resistances in the circuit R1, R2 and R3. The two ends that is the starting end of the first resistance R1 is connected to one of the terminal of the battery and the other end the finishing end of the last resistance is connected to another terminal of the battery that is the source of voltage. The voltage which has been applied between the two ends of the circuit it will be equal to V and due to this voltage there will be flow of current in the circuit and this current is represented by I. As soon as this current starts flowing in the circuit, then the voltage drop will be there. What is voltage drop? It is nothing but the product of current and the resistance. Voltage drop is represented by V1. So, V1 represents the voltage drop across R1. Similarly, there is voltage drop across R2 that is represented by V2. V2 represents the voltage drop across resistance R2 and another one is the voltage drop across R3 that is V3. So, these are the three voltage drops. Since there are three resistances, there are three voltage drops. Each is represented by V1, V2 as well as V3. V is the total voltage applied between the two ends of the circuit. I is the total current flowing in the circuit. With this information, let us look into another picture which also shows the series connection of resistances and this picture shows the actual resistor, the practical circuit wherein this is a battery, the source of supply and it is connected in series with three different resistances that is 2.5 kilo ohms and the another one, the magnitude of this one is 1 kilo ohm whereas this is 3 kilo ohm resistor, all are connected in series. Now, let us look into the effective resistance in such a case. That is what would be the total resistances, total resistance in the circuit when the resistances are connected in series. The total R effective resistance in a series circuit is given by this equation that is let V1 be the voltage drop across R1 and V2 is the voltage drop across R2 and V3, V3 is the voltage drop across R3 and V is the total voltage applied across the circuit and I is the total current which is flowing in the circuit. Okay. And R represent, what is R? R is the effective or the effective and total are one and the same. Okay. So, total are effective resistance in the circuit. So, what is the total resistance in the circuit? Let us see now. Okay. The total voltage across the circuit, actually V is the voltage applied across the circuit. Okay. Look into this picture one second. This is the voltage applied across the circuit and this is the current, this is the these are the three resistors and these are the three voltage drops V1, V2 as well as V3. Okay. So, the total voltage across the circuit is given by the sum of all the voltage drops. 
how many voltage drops are there? 3 voltage drops represented by V1, V2 as well as V3 and the total voltage drop is given by the sum of these 3 components. So, V is equal to V1 plus V2 plus V3 by Ohm's law. Ohm's law gives the relationship between current and resistance as well as voltage. So, by Ohm's law I is equal to V by R or V is equal to I into R. Let us use this equation that is V is equal to I into R that is voltage is the product of current and, current and resistance. So, I R V is let us substitute I into R for V. So, the equation becomes instead of V I into R V 1 is replaced by I into R 1 V 2 is equal to I into R 2 plus instead of V 3 it is I into R 3. I is a common factor. So, by taking I as the common factor then the equation becomes then the equation becomes I into R is equal to I into by taking I as the common factor it is equal to I into R 1 plus R 2 plus R 3. Since I is a common factor on both sides of the equation I gets cancelled. Therefore, the total or effective resistance in the circuit it is given by R is equal to R 1 plus R 2 plus R 3. This is the total resistance in a series circuit. This is the effective resistance where only 3 resistances are connected. If there are n number of resistances the same can be expanded to n number of resistors also. Therefore, the effective resistance with in a circuit which consists of n number of resistance is given by R is equal to R 1 plus R 2 plus R 3 up to R n. So, the total F or the effective resistance is given by the arithmetic sum of all the resistances which are connected in the circuit. So, what are the characteristics of the series circuit by this equation? Let us see now. So, in a series circuit what happens? The current flowing through each resistance is same. So, what would be the current? It is the same current the same current is flowing through n number of resistors. If there are 2 resistors, same current is flowing through both the resistors. If there are 3 resistors, same current I is flowing through 3 resistors. If there are n number of resistors, the same current I is flowing through n number of resistors also. There will not be any change in the magnitude of current which is flowing through all the resistances which are connected in series. Okay. So, the current will be same current will be same it will be represented by I only. Okay. So, this is the first and foremost important characteristic of a series circuit that is the current through each resistance is same. Second important characteristic is the total voltage applied across the circuit. The total voltage applied across the circuit is it is the sum of all the individual voltage drops. Okay. And another important characteristic is the effective resistance is equal to the individual resistances which are connected in series. So, these are the characteristics of the series circuit. So, the current is same, the total voltage is equal to the sum of all the individual voltages and the effective resistance is equal to the sum of all the individual resistances connected in the series. So, let me summarize today's topics. In today's session, I try to explain about the importance of resistance, the unit of resistance and the different pattern that is only the series connection. The other type pattern will be discussed in the next session and what will be the effective resistance in the series circuit and what are the different type of instruments which are used to measure resistance in the circuit. Thank you.